Penn Central was created by a merger six years ago. For the last four years, it's been in bankruptcy. So far, it's been a downhill run. During a single recent month, Penn Central suffered 649 derailments, ranging from a single car or locomotive to pileups of 10, 15, or more. They damaged 252 locomotives and 1,637 freight cars. They caused cargo damage of more than $400,000. No railroad, let alone Penn Central, can afford such losses. Each derailment is symptomatic of the deterioration of our plant and equipment, which has been going on for years and is now rapidly getting worse. The basic ingredients of plant and equipment needed for operation of a railroad are tracks, rolling stock, locomotives, classification yards and terminals, and supporting facilities such as repair and maintenance shops. This is our major car repair center at Hollidaysburg, Pennsylvania. The bankruptcy trustees have done their best to give good railroad service. But Penn Central has not been able to generate revenues sufficient to prevent continuing deterioration of its track and equipment, including its freight car fleet. Penn Central has about 150,000 freight cars. Nearly 13% of them are out of service. Uh, the cars that you see are those that are waiting to be repaired. There's about 5,000 cars in this yard. On the whole system, there's approximately, including what we have here, there's approximately 19,000 cars waiting to be repaired. There are cars that have been uh, damaged, uh, cars that have uh, deteriorated through uh, service, cars that have been uh, damaged by the shipper. If we put all the cars together that are in need of repair, there's approximately 200 miles of cars to be repaired. For the casual glance of a non-railroader, many of the thousands of cars clogging our yards at Hollidaysburg and Altoona appear to be usable, but they're not. They're just idle to us. We can't use them to uh, get revenue. We're short of gondolas for for steel loading, we're short of hopper cars for coal, and we're short of box cars for the general merchandise. Because it cannot supply enough cars to meet the demands of shippers, Penn Central is losing more than $150,000 in freight revenue each day. That's nearly $70 million a year of lost revenue. The shortage of cars worsens continually because new cars are not being acquired to replace the many which are too old for repair. Penn Central's freight car fleet has decreased 20,000 cars since... We're cutting up about 25 cars a day and probably by the end of the year we'll have 6,000 cars cut up. They're over 40 years old, the most of them, and we bring them here and then we salvage all of them until we can to reuse on any rebuilding program or repair program. And the uh, wheels are one of the most hard products to come by. We have all our wheels, axles, which we reuse, our truck frames, our couplers, our yokes, every piece of material in the car we're reusing. This is our, this is our supply. We live off of it. Every day, we turn out a few cars which have been repaired. In their fresh coats of paint, they look pretty good. But appearances are deceiving. We have to get cars going, so we're taking off the parts that are absolutely shot and trying to substitute patches and so on. We are doing a patchwork job to get about three or four years out of uh, the cars we have in service. We ought to start a heavy repair program of rebuilding hoppers in order to put them back in service for 10 to 12 years. Well, it's going to be uh, actually a catastrophe two or three years down the road unless we start a heavy repair program the next 12 to 18 months on hopper cars. 
Routine and minor repairs to freight cars are performed in what we call spot repair shops. There are 36 in the Penn Central system. 29 do not meet requirements, like this one at Morrisville, Pennsylvania. The airlines freeze up. There's problems with the jacks. Don't work properly because moisture in the airlines and stuff like that. Uh, as far as doing repacks go, uh, pads in the boxes, water in the journal boxes, pads become frozen. Sometimes, you know, it takes quite a while to get them out. It's a little hard walking around, especially when these, the jacks that we use and stuff like that. It's a little hard pushing them around in the ice and the snow. And it makes things a little complicated sometimes. It's pretty tough. I uh, have to get down in the snow and under the cars and everything. Well, I prefer something better than this here. It's uh, pretty miserable in the wintertime. It's pretty chilly. You, you can't perform 100% under these conditions. No man can. With the elements and the, and the working conditions themselves, why, uh, it's just impossible. You can't get the material. A lot of jobs, you have to skip a little bit, scrimp, do what you can. Got to rob Peter to pay Paul. So you're doing double work. I believe there, there's room for improvement somewhere. There's got to be. There is indeed room for improvement. And among our 36 spot repair shops are a handful we did improve before we ran out of money. This one is at Columbus, Ohio. This is a... The, second shop on the Penn Central that was built with a uh, roof overhead and uh, doors on the end of the building where you can shut out the, uh, the weather. This is uh, the type of operation where the material is on hand at the work location and the cars are advanced to the men rather than take the men walking to the cars as is done in the older type of operation. Now this type of uh, facility will produce uh, average 50 cars a day, some days 60 cars. We can do that with the same force that uh, we used to produce half, so the efficiency is practically double. It makes a lot of difference. The men are men are happy. They're uh, they feel like they're part of a team, and uh, they like it. We all like it. Freight cars, of course, require locomotives to haul them. That leads us into another problem of growing dimension, motive power. While Penn Central acquired some new engines in the first years of bankruptcy, we now need to replace others that are growing old, but funds are not available. This locomotive is an AR-16. It's a 1,600-horsepower unit, and it's over 20 years old. And the problem with this type of locomotive, because of uh, pollution, when, it, when they're going through local towns, and it's, they just create too much smoke. And it's mainly used as a switching locomotive or in local freight service. But because of the conditions, we try to keep them in the yard. In this division, we operate 100 of this type locomotive and about approximately 25% are in this condition. At least one of every four of this type locomotive should be either rebuilt or replaced. Like all power units, locomotives require fuel and maintenance. This is where locomotives are serviced in the Chicago region. Uh, our service facility for just the uh, service road units only has uh, one stanchion on one side for the freight and one on the other side for our, our yard service. And uh, we can only serve 60 to 80 a day with this setup. And if we had to increase the facility, say go to six stanchions, then we could increase that threefold. Our Chicago shop, designed for steam engines, is nearly 60 years old. It's one of 20 locomotive shops we operate. 15 of them, like this one, need modernization or replacement. Again, there is no money to do the job. Well, the working conditions are pretty bad. The pits are uh, too shallow, dirty, and uh, you don't have the material 
to fix the things with. It is not set up too good for this, you know, in a way where it throws you off. Just like you had to take these slack of vessels down. There's certain pits that you can't take them down on. There's certain pits you can take it on because the, some some pits over on the other side of the tracks are right down with the concrete. And just like this flow here, well, this is a uh, not a concrete flow. You better got it high clean, you can put it on. I put these clothes on this morning clean. And this is shaped as nine days and you're about gone. So, you can figure that out. I want to try to, what you're working in. Then we, once it, this stuff is all, you know, like it used to be in, in uh, it's manpower. We have no, uh, uh, nothing, you know, can outrage us and things like that. You should take things a little quick. Save a man, save time too. But, and otherwise, it's just, it's just a rough place to work. Well, if I had to live my life over again, I'd never work for a railroad. We do our best, but uh, with improved service facility, we could probably increase our own facility's truck output by maybe 40 to 50 percent. There's a terribly frustrating aspect to Penn Central's difficulties. Our few modern operations, like this locomotive shop near Albany, New York, show us on a daily basis how much operating expense can be saved with efficient facilities. They also demonstrate sharp improvements in employee morale and productivity. The shop itself runs pretty smooth. The locomotives have progressed, and uh, everyone around here works good. They work together very good. On a whole, this shop is capable of doing any repair job to any locomotive on the railroad. This is our terminal at Columbus, Ohio, for handling trail van or piggyback traffic. It's one of 39 such terminals Penn Central operates. All are too small for this increasing traffic. All are rated in either bad condition or poor condition. Maintenance of these yards, as in so many cases, had to be deferred, not through choice, but because we simply didn't have the money. Yeah, you might characterize it as a a uh, situation where you have lots of people to come to your to your circus, but you can't put on enough performances to get all of them inside the tent. We want to do a better job, and we can do a better job, and our people want to do a better job, but we're just uh, hamstrung, hamstrung, so to speak. Classification yards, where freight cars are sorted out for routing to hundreds of destinations, are essential to the operation of a railroad. Penn Central has 14 major classification yards, which we call hump yards. This one at New Haven, Connecticut, is illustrative of eight, which are in similar bad condition. Those are retarders. They're all operated manually by uh, tower retarder operators. They're to slow the car down, space them right going in on the tracks, the various tracks, and to uh, hold back on impacts. They've been here since 1925, and they're had it as far as the uh, retarding of the cars. They just won't hold a heavy load. They call this the toothpick machine. Wood blocks hold heavy cars partway down the hump so they will not hit the retarders with too much velocity. It's an existence, not railroading. One thing breaks down and you get that fixed and up comes another problem. You've got a lot of deteriorated ties in the yard causing the rail to spread. And then you got your angle bars sitting on a lot of bad ties. You'll break an angle bar and show your cars way out like these are here. Uh, on an average day and an average good day, uh, without a derailment, uh, uh, we average uh, 1,300 cars in 24 hours humping. They don't have many such days at New Haven. There have been 57 derailments there in two months, almost one a day. But that's not as bad as Cleveland. Our yard there has been averaging five or six derailments a night. Track condition is, is, is the main uh, trouble we're having. Uh, we've got 56 uh, class tracks uh, 
and the arch should hold uh, 1,300 cars, and right now we're down to uh, 11 of these tracks out of service, which means that uh, 325 car lengths of, uh, of room is, uh, is being wasted that we can't use. Uh, this means that uh, we're switching uh, classifications to tracks that uh, actually the classification shouldn't be on, and we have to re-switch these tracks, which sometimes means uh, 12 to uh, 13 tracks a day. And uh, by doing this, we're using, uh, uh, at times, extra switchers, which is uh, money that we, we, we shouldn't be spending. Money we shouldn't be spending. That's a key to Penn Central's predicament. We wouldn't have to spend a lot of it if our major yards were all like this one at Columbus, the only one we've built since the merger. It's a model of efficiency. Except for brakemen to uncouple the cars, it's a no-hands operation. A computer directs each car to its proper track. It also operates the retarders, automatically slowing cars, regardless of weight or size, to exactly the speed they need to couple gently to the cars on the track ahead. We take pride in an operation like this, for it represents modern railroading at its best. But for every dollar we save at efficient installations, we lose many more at antiquated and dilapidated yards. Penn Central operates 49 small classification yards. They're known as flat yards. 30 are inadequate, in poor condition, or both, like this one at Newark, New Jersey. It doesn't even have automatic signals and switches for through freight trains. It serves the metropolitan area of northern New Jersey and New York City. One end of the yard, the west end of the yard, uh, freight trains coming in off of the main line, handled by a switch tender, uh, manual operated switches. Only one train at a time can move through the switches at Waverly 5. The maintenance of the track has cut us down to where freight trains passing through the uh, passing through the Waverly complex are limited to five miles an hour uh, along the side of the yard here. There's one move being made through the switches at Waverly 5. Everything slows down if, if, it, if it does not stop. We have to flat switch in three different areas in the yard to handle the volume of the cars that come through Waverly. We try to put uh, 27 classifications in on 20 tracks that uh, range in length from 40 car lengths down to four car lengths long. We end up spending a lot of the day rehandling cars, picking up cars that possibly are derailed due to the uh, due to the maintenance that's uh, in here. Over my left shoulder, we have the an industrial lead of approximately 25 to 30 Cotonese that's on the other side of the passenger main from Philadelphia, Washington, through to New York. The car arrives on the right-hand side of the yard over here. The car is rehandled approximately three times to get to the other side of the yard and onto the Cotonese siding. We're talking about approximately 24 to 36 hours from the time the car actually arrives until it's in a position for the industrial crew to shove up the number five track on the other side into the constantly siding. It's a little tough to explain to a constantly why it takes 36 hours to move a car 100 yards. There are some classification yards on our system where we don't have to apologize for delays. Yards improved or rebuilt when we had funds to do it. They're examples of efficiency that show how our yards can and should perform. This is the Penn Central Niagara Yard uh, in Niagara Falls, New York. It's a flat switching yard uh, comprised of seven receiving tracks, 28 classification tracks, uh, two main tracks for both east and westbound traffic through uh, Canada to the west. We can receive trains uh, through freight trains on our main tracks or on the north side of our yard and continue our switching operation on the uh, south side of the yard without interference. It's, uh, it's a good yard. It's better than what was previously here. With the clearances we have, with the easy grade on our switching lead, this is a, uh, a very efficient operation of, for a flat switching yard. It's, I, I feel it's much more better production here in this yard. You're not handling the cars over and over like we used to the other yard for one thing. I don't feel that we're doing any more work. We're handling more cars with less work, I think, and uh, 
it's, it's much better. I mean, it's much safer, a lot better than it was. We, we appreciate that. This is the result of deferred maintenance. Tracks so badly in need of repair that we risk derailment and perhaps human lives every time we run trains over. Since we have to use it, and because we have no funds for repair, we run our trains at reduced speeds, often 8 or 10 miles per hour. This is one of scores of branch and secondary lines which contribute to the 8,400 miles of bad track in the Penn Central system. It's the Petersburg Secondary which runs between Indianapolis and Evansville, Indiana through an area with important bituminous coal reserves. It cannot be abandoned because it serves a vital public purpose, particularly in the energy crisis. This line serves uh Indianapolis Power and Light and provides about 90% of the coal for the Indianapolis Power and Light Company. The first thing would be uh, to get some decent rail on this line. Then we'd have to get, uh, after we got the rail on, we'd have to renew all the bad ties and, uh, of course, clean the ballast to eliminate these mud conditions. So, when I first started on this line here, it was 30 mile an hour track, and now it's down to 10 mile an hour. If you get over 10 mile an hour, you get a pretty, pretty dangerous ride. You have a lot on public, you're ready to jump the track at that. I uh, feel a lot safer. It was better. We could run faster, get over the road better. It seems like a shame, Billy, a revenue train out for three days when it could be over the road in 10 hours. From 10 miles an hour in southern Indiana to 50 miles an hour in western Ohio. This is also a secondary line, but it has a relatively new roadbed with welded rail and has not had time to deteriorate from deferred maintenance. Amid the spreading decay of the Penn Central network, it stands as a vivid reminder that with first-rate tracks, road operations could be efficient, speedy, and profitable. The main lines of Penn Central are the railroad's most vital arteries for commerce, industry, and agriculture in America's Midwest and Northeast. Some are still in good condition because of fairly recent improvements. Our Mohawk Valley route between Albany and Utica, New York, where we can run on a solid roadbed, typifies our potential for transportation service. It does not, however, typify our main line tracks. Metroliners speeding between New York and Washington offer the nation's best passenger service. It cost more than $30 million to rebuild the passenger tracks for high-speed operation. But the Northeast Corridor has track problems for the movement of freight. Take, for example, the route of our freight trains around Wilmington, Delaware. We really have, in effect, a single track here because of the restrictions on the two bridges. While one train uses the bridge, others have to be held back waiting for clearance. And it's always in trouble. You can't lock it up, can't open it. And it's rough going over it with trains. It doesn't feel very nice. You see the train coming down and the car is rocking him to a no normal speed. Makes me feel like running out of here before he gets here. Nearly 5,000 miles of our main lines are infected with the disease of deferred maintenance. This is a main line between uh, Columbus and Chicago, Columbus and St. Louis, main freight line. Between Columbus and uh, Bradford, my territory, there's about 72 miles. I have uh, about 30 slow orders at, ten, at uh, 30 miles an hour, and I have 7 to 10 miles an hour. I don't like running on this track. It's too rough. I think it's unsafe to run on. The rail is good, but there just isn't any roadbed underneath it. You don't build highways on mud, and that's what this has done. Uh, we got the equipment. Uh, they're talking about new equipment, uh, you know, passenger equipment, which I think is fine. But, of course, we don't know nothing about passenger. We're freight men. But uh, we got the equipment to take these trains across the track 100 mile an hour right now. We don't need uh, uh, We got the engines will do it. We just need something under that track to run on. It stands for reason that you 
you can have the best equipment if you don't have nothing to run on you're, you're not going to go I'd like to rebuild it from the bottom up I need men, rail, ties and equipment to do it well I'm ashamed of it With large segments of our railroad handicapped by bad track, the slowdown multiplies all expenses that are dependent on time, such as crew wages and equipment costs. Utilization of plant, equipment, and manpower. Each goes down. For instance, we're averaging 10 trains a day delayed because locomotives are not available. Not available because they're tied up for days on runs which should take hours. This leads to another expensive burden. Our crews cannot work more than 12 hours. At the end of 12 hours, the law requires that their train be stopped and a relief crew sent to take over. This is costing Penn Central more than $400,000 each month. But it's the effect of track conditions on operating expenses that causes the most concern. For example, during the week of February 25th through March 3rd, we had 153 derailments. It cost us nearly $400,000 just to clear them. Over two-thirds were caused by track conditions. This, this rail's wore up. The life is gone. I think it's, what is it, 1941, I think it is. It started cracking right here. Broke at an angle up. There were about three-quarters to the top of the first bolt hole. About a 45-degree angle up. And then progressively, as trains went over, it broke out to around 14 inches. If we're going to run freight over these things, we've got to rebuild the track. No way in the world to get it over this way. The effect of these track and equipment conditions on Penn Central's effort to compete successfully in the transportation market needs no explanation. Because of the reduced speeds, on-time performance in many cases is a practical impossibility. Because of the large number of our freight cars in need of repair, as well as slow transit time, we fall far short of satisfying customer requirements for cars. It's not only that, it's the delay of the freight. People are expecting the damn stuff. Hell, if you're going to serve people, you've got to get it there today on time, or you don't run. To use an old simile, it's like a snowball rolling downhill. Without immediate and substantial help, Penn Central will roll downhill at an ever-increasing rate. Its destination could be disaster. Now, 34 years out here beating your brains out, end up with something like this.